<clears throat> Welcome back. We had a good lunch. That was, have you all had a good lunch? Seemed to come out like a drill wrapper. It's crazy how quickly the hour and a half goes. It seems like an hour and a half is a long time to give people for lunch, but it's uh, we're always like, Shit, we're going to be late. Mm. Kate, your trousers are coming on beautifully. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Looking really good. Right. The next hour and a quarter, there or thereabouts, we're going to be doing questions, observations, and reflections. Chance for people Basically to Basically anything. Yeah, just... I've kind of put that, but I've realised this is a time just for people to share, and it can be anything. Yeah. How have, you, how have you found the retreat? Have you found it? Has it, has it been worthwhile? Has it it's been settling? Has it brought around any realizations? Is it, you know, or is there anything that's been making your heart sing that you've seen about life lately? Is it, you know, an opportunity for, for interaction? I think likewise, if you've got any questions, how does it fit into this and what about this and what about that, which many people do, don't think there is such a thing as a wrong question. There really, really isn't. And quite often, like, somebody will ask a question, they'll go, oh, I've been meaning to ask that question. So please just don't be shy. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Mr. Hello. Uh, it's SAR, actually. If you're going to abbreviate it, it's SAR, because it's SAR. I'm posh like Kate, you see. You are, aren't you? We have a friend called Sarah, but she spells it S-A-R-A. Uh, it yeah. took us ages to get used to calling her Sarah. <laughs> now we're it's confused again. Yeah. Sarah. 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 There we go. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> so Kate's been nagging me to come back to my question from yesterday. Well, nagging, just gently prodding, saying that probably people would be interested and there's part of me going, no, 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 let's just let it be. And So what I've been talking about with Kate to get a little bit more specific from yesterday is um, my last relationship was with a really amazing guy who was... Um, he was severely abused as a child, like a lot of violence and a lot of fear. Um, and he had these incredible experiences as a child of going beyond his mind. Like he, he talks about going, going down a tunnel and being in the light and being in this complete bliss, but knowing that he had to go back again and again and again. And these stories really... Oh, they made such a big impact on me when we first met and I fell deeply in love with him. Um, but sort of six months in when he moved in together, he, I could see that there were still so many fears there, which I hadn't seen before we were living together because he, we weren't in that space where he was being, where his fears were being activated. And so we spent sort of two years living together where it just, it, for me, it felt harder and harder and harder to be loving towards him because there was a lot of anger, not necessarily at me. He wasn't violent, but he was very negative and he's very critical about the world and he compares everybody negatively. So, you know, his mind is doing this real judgment thing of everyone's an idiot and but it, you know, I could, there was also another part of me which could see what was happening for him. And I, you know, there was a lot of compassion and I was tiptoeing around him a lot of the time, you know, trying not to do or say anything which I thought might trigger him. He had super low self-esteem. I was always trying to build him up and support him. And, and it just, it, I, yeah, anyway, the relationship broke down uh, not quite a year ago, nine months ago. And 
because I can see he's I can see these two parts of him like so clearly in him because of because of these incredible experiences he had as a child and of course he had he had moments of that <clears throat> as an adult as well he had this real sort of childlike has this really childlike uh, energy and spirit um, which was just beautiful to be around but then there was this other part when whenever the fears were activated and I know now from talking to Kate it's like I just need to not take everything personally and I need to not react but and I went to Kate with a question recently you know is it what do you think about the idea of going back and trying to resurrect a relationship you know and I did this a lot when I was younger <laughs> like there was one guy I was on and off with seven times and I think with that relationship I just reached the end and I was like I'm never going to do that again because it's just too painful and it doesn't work um so there's a belief like just don't go back and then there's a belief of he's an amazing guy and I see that he's pure and he's love and but then I find it really hard to be around him when he's not seeing that and I, I fall out of knowing that I am as well and then we end up in this in this not joyful loving dance together um, and <laughs> um, he, you know, I, I sort of said to him before the end, I was trying to get us to go to counselling, couples counselling together, and he was resisting everything. And I said, you know, we have to be able to have these difficult conversations, because if you always resist them, we can't move forward. It's like he, he wouldn't talk about finances, so he just didn't pay, but then there was also no opportunity for conversation to go into that. So... You know, I sort of say, you know, we have to have these conversations which feel, which might be difficult and hard because otherwise we're not going to move forwards. And I remember him saying, relationships shouldn't be hard and difficult. But then I was like, but you're, you know, you're being too simplistic and childish about it. And, and now I'm hearing, oh, fuck, maybe he was right. <laughs> and I've got so many different aspects of the relationship and understanding and seeing things and perspectives and... <laughs> And I, uh, whew, yeah, <laughs> Jen, your face. <laughs> no, do, I can just see, like, when you're describing it, just how much is on your mind about it. And um, one of the things I heard you say earlier was, you know, you should, I know I shouldn't take it personally and I sh shouldn't do this and yeah red flag but it is well not, not necessarily when you say red flags what do you mean by that sorry to interrupt you oh, sorry. just what the word should should is like we're judge we're putting judgment on something okay yeah there's a, a guy called Bill Pettit who shares this he's a psychiatrist he said don't should all over yourself or other people yeah, because because there really isn't, uh, you know, we often say, I think I heard this at a conference initially, but this is descriptive rather than prescriptive. So there isn't kind of a prescription of how you should now be if you understand the principles. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? I know when I came across the principles and I had my massive awakening. And it was massive for my life, you know, it's. Yeah. People say, oh, you've, you've had a deep awakening. We're talking about infinity. You cannot measure infinity. So what is depth within infinity? How deep is deep within infinity? It's like, it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's nonsense at that level. But I, I did, I, I, I thought I had to be a certain way. Now I've seen this. I have to always be a certain way. And I entered into this infinite freedom and come back and condense myself with another set of beliefs mm. over a period of time. Over a period of time, I condense myself with another set of beliefs. Sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. Um, yes, yeah, so I was just going to, that was one of the things, and 
only you will know whether or not this is a relationship you want to re-explore. And from you sent me a quick message and from what you've said, like that this resonates with you, but it's also like there's there's more that's come up over this weekend. And as we change, like Dave says, if a relationship is two people and each person's 50%, if 50% changes, the whole thing is different. You describe it as if you've got um, paint and tin of black paint yeah no, tin, of, tin of white paint say and then 50 percent of it changes to black suddenly the whole thing will become gray it's completely different so that will be <clears throat> something that will that will come to you whether or not that's something you want to re-explore like i've got no idea mm. um but and one then, of the other things that came to me was you, you can't get life wrong that's what was coming to me and i think yeah. sometimes we spend a lot of time in preoccupation about making the right answer uh, the right decision i've got to make the right decision i've got to make the right decision i can't get this wrong this is really important mm. and then we preoccupy our mind and a, gr a really great friend of mine when i was going through a a, a different uh, challenging time where it felt like i had big decisions to make in my life she just said to me you don't have to make a decision, but a decision will be made. Mm. And I remember it like that took it off my to-do list to mm -hmm. figure it out. And then what happened was my mind quietened and I found myself having all kinds of conversations and or you know, dealing with life and <clears throat> moving forward. But that was the, one of the most helpful statements that I think I could have heard at that time was, you don't have to make a decision, but a decision will be made. Mm. And the other thing that occurred to me is that when we do settle and do have a quieter mind, things do seem clearer and do seem more obvious. And I think the if we're feeling like in our head, there's a really good indicator that actually right now you just don't know, you know, you don't know. And I loved it in Roger's trainings because he'd always... Because after that initial training, he came back about three times over the year to do the train the trainer program. And we'd be in a room and he would see when people had started getting heady trying to figure stuff out. Like he got such a sense or feel for the room. And he'd always be like, let's take a break. And he knew that in the break, when people would go off to the toilet, go and get a drink, they'd stop trying to figure it out. And that's when things would pop in. And then when we'd all meet back up again, it wouldn't be so heady mm. and I think that's one of the things you start to notice about your own mind is when when to make decisions and when just to leave it alone mm. and you can't get it wrong yeah and it's funny Kate Kate and I were messaging just before this session she's like you know you should ask you know bring it up again because I think you know you have a good way of talking about these things and other people will hear stuff and blah, blah, blah. And I responded to her. I was like, mm, I have a sense that maybe I just need, need to leave it alone for now because there's just too much going on and just also maybe to absorb this whole weekend with you all. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, I asked a question just out of curiosity and I've gone down a rabbit hole with it. <laughs> um, well, I think your question is probably very relevant to people on the call. Certainly. So it's, it is good to, <laughs> to bring these things up just because there'll be other people maybe that have a similar situation or yeah. people hear things when people ask questions. Yeah. And it was, it was interesting yesterday. I'm friends with, because he doesn't have family, but he has, um, uh, like he calls them heart family. Um, and it's actually his ex-girlfriend from a long time ago. He brought up her daughter for, I think, 14 years. They were living together. And I was, and I know the, the mother. I, so I know his ex, basically. And uh, we had a little chat and she was like, I totally hear you. He's difficult. I wouldn't go back there and blah, 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 blah. And I could feel my ego going, I'm justified and da, 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 you know, because I was hearing 
her reflection and her um, her experience, and that was sort of yeah, it was really like Kate. You know, Kate uses the metaphor of the bubble. You know, the more that you look at it, the more it expands. And then hearing Sonia's perspective was like, oh yeah, and you know, I'm right. But I'm yeah, I. I I'm conscious of this, you know, letting go of needing to be right. I think that was a big thing for us both in the relationship. <clears throat> um, we both come from, you know, a lot of years of teaching yoga and studying scriptures and teaching meditation and philosophy and all of this stuff. So there's this, um, and I was lucky actually to have my experiences in the ocean which was a real embodiment, like it was just way beyond thinking. And uh, so that's that's great. I think I, I struggle sometimes to re to take those experiences and translate them into the into my everyday life. It's like and then what I hear here is like, it's OK, that's also OK. You know, I'm just because I had moments of Oh, I get I get it in the water. It's okay if I don't get it in this relationship or the next relationship or or any or life. Or life. You know yeah. it's it, people think that when you experience those experiences you should live in that space forever. Yeah. What would you get done? What would you do? What would you go and see? What would you play? What else would you experience? Nothing. You know, the whole point of being on earth as a human being is to experience life as a human being. Mm. It's like the woodlouse. The sole purpose of the woodlouse is to experience life as a woodlouse. A tree, its sole purpose on life is to experience life as a tree. Mm. You know, we're always trying to escape. We're always running away from. My niece just wrote a poem, and it's called You Can Run, But You Cannot Hide. It's about life. Mm -hmm. You can run away from it, but you can't hide from it. Mm -hmm. You take it with you everywhere you go. We're, we're not talking about living in a certain mm -hmm. state of being continuously. We're talking about becoming aware, aware of how reality is created, where reality exists. And then we start to take responsibility for our, ourselves. We start to take responsibility for our emotions and our behavior, which instantly makes our life easier. We understand, we can see it. When we see it, we can see in other people what's going on. Well, they're living in their thought created experience of life, full stop. <clears throat> which then takes the personal out of us. It's not what they think is what they think. It's not personal to me. That's their thoughts. It's got nothing to do with me. That's their thoughts. Takes the personal out of it. You see life objectively. You see life with an objective view. Makes life easier. I mean, you as having been a formerly... This is a big label, a formerly angry man. Um, like, and some, well, I suppose you talked about it, didn't you, this morning about this guy wanting to mug you? And you didn't, yeah, you didn't. Okay, but, but that's different because you don't have a relationship with him. I think I get stuck in this personal relationship, romantic relationship, love relationship. You know, where there's there's so much expectation and attachment, isn't there? That I think what we get stuck in is we don't realise <clears throat> that everybody we meet is a character we've made up. Hmm. However you perceive him, he's a character made up from your own imagination, your own thought, your own belief system. Because I'm never seeing him in his fullness. Only you see him how you see him. Yeah. I often say to people, I'm really thankful I don't see my dad like my mum does. <laughs> Thank God. 
yeah. my dad is a very different character who I experience to who my mum experiences. And thank God I don't see my mum like my dad does. <laughs> and thank God I don't see my sister like my brother-in-law does. Yeah. You see, we're all a character. When we talk about we living in a thought-created dream state reality, we're talking about from birth till death, there is no outside of it. So everybody we meet, we cast judgment upon it, and we create character for the individual. We create who we see as another individual. They exist within us. You know, you could, that your, I don't know, your ex is, your ex, you could, you could line him up with 10 other women. Let him sit down at each table for however long you had. And listen to what they had to say. And chances are you might get, oh, he's a bit frigging out there. A bit wishy-washy. You'd get, oh, he's, he's, he's all right. I remember walking into a, a nightclub one time and this girl stood there with a mate went, oh, he's gorgeous. And her mate went, are you kidding me? He's minging. Yeah. You know, yeah. We all see a different reality, including down to the individuals that we meet. Yeah. You know, not. I find it very difficult to believe that not everybody finds Jenny attractive. I really find her attractive. But there was a point when I actually didn't, not like I do now. So the character of Jenny changed within my own being. And people evolve within our own consciousness. Why? Because our mind changes. So you may meet somebody and go, absolutely not. He is not for me. In fact, Christine Heath spoke about Christine. this. Christine last night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is not my, this isn't, he's not my type. And then the mind changes, the character of who we are meeting changes. Why? Because they are a figment of our imagination. We are creating the character of them within our own being. Mm. They suddenly start to look attractive. Mm. So we, we, we think we meet people, we meet our own mind. Just occurred when um, there's a guy called Aaron Turner that's done lots of work in business. And I remember him telling a story of, they were going to be working with 50 people. I think it was, I think it was within BAE Systems and he was doing intake. Um, and he just said everyone was coming in and just talking about this boss. He was, a, he was an arsehole. Everyone hated him. He was difficult. He was this, he was that. And I think Aaron said it was weird because he started to think, oh God, maybe it's this boss. We need to, you know, we need to get rid of him. We need to, maybe it is the boss. And he said then one person that he did intake with, didn't have that opinion of this boss. He said, oh, you know, you can see he's got a lot on his mind. I don't, you know, I wouldn't take, I don't take him personally. I don't, I don't feel like he's, um, he's a bad boss. Um, I, you know, I come in, I do my job, I, I leave. I don't feel like I have to do overtime. And, and Aaron said he saw how when we start getting social support yeah. or our ideas or other people sort of agree with us, we think that makes it more true. He said, but that one person seeing him differently showed it wasn't a truth. Mm. And I think that's something that we, we often look for other people to collaborate our story. Validate. And mm. I, I always remember <clears throat> doing a talk with Dickon. It's the first time uh, just, just Dickon and I had done an event together with about 80 people. And on day two, I just had, Dickon was talking and I just had this moment where I looked at my mum and dad in the front row. My mum's best friend was there who'd known me since I was a child <laughs> who'd said to me, God, I couldn't believe it yesterday seeing you on stage speaking in front of 80 people when you were this shy kid that hid behind your mum's legs. <coughs> and I kind of looked at them. And then suddenly it was like my story of everyone in my family vanished. And I just saw other beings it's, I can't describe it. it it wasn't a word thing but mm. I just I fell in love with them mm. and I just burst into tears because it was like I got to see not my mum and dad my characters my judgments my mm. I just got to 
it, it was it was mind blowing. I burst into tears on the stage. Mm. It took Dick a little while to notice that I was crying because I was I was, being, I was being quite discreet. And then it was like it spread out, and it was just for everyone. And I thought, wow, like. What happens when our story vanishes and we get to see with new, like newborn eyes or clear eyes or... Present. And I don't know, I just, I fell in love with them so deeply. And it changed something in me. And like now I've said to you, there's times where when we're in the North, um, we live with Dave's family, and when we're in the South, we, we live with my family. And there's times where I get so irritated with my dad and I'm like always like that he's so over the top he's this or the way he spoke to my mum or I don't know just and then there's other times when I'm just like oh, what an amazing man he's so kind what an incredible gift it is that they allow us to stay in their home and nothing's changed but I can experience him as really irritating or I can experience him as the most gen generous loving human being and all in the same day. Yeah. I mean, like, you're, and sometimes you're like, oh, I think you've been a bit harsh. Or... <laughs> I don't think you've quite been harsh enough. Yeah. <laughs> but it, you see, like, <laughs> the discriminator is your mind. Mm. That's the thing that changes. That's why there's somebody in my family who I used to find so difficult. Whenever they came to mind, I'd be like, ugh. And... On, on another retreat, they happened to be there. And I remember looking at them and just feeling nothing but love and compassion. I thought, wow, God, I don't think I've ever experienced that with, with you. I've always found you really irritating. And... It just looks like who they are. Yeah, so it's... <coughs> mindful <coughs> consciousness is like this instant creation. It's instant reality. Why would we question it? But you, you, if you look at your mind and how sometimes it would probably feel unbearable and I don't know if I can live like this. Other times you're like, oh, I've got so much compassion and understanding why you're like you are at the moment. It doesn't affect me as much. It's when it's personal and when it isn't personal. Mm. I think the nice thing is, is that we only have to see this for ourselves and know it to be true. And then it's almost like the way unfolds for us. And we see it in other people. I've just noticed Ali has her hand up and I thought it just, probably, uh, probably would be Can I just connected. quickly just tell one more story? But is it about this, Al? I think it, I think it would be. Yeah, go for it, love. Oh. Um. My husband and I have been through a difficult time for the past couple of years, and there are some similarities with Sarah's story in terms of he can be quite an angry person. Um, he had a difficult childhood, and he's had some interesting spiritual experiences and has some, over the years, he's built up an insight into how things work. But it didn't stop him being angry, and it didn't stop us ending up at a point where we were kind of, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to split up? Are we going to get divorced? What are we going to do? Um, very briefly, I was kind of in and out of the three principles on and off for a couple of years. Um, and at the beginning of this year, because my sister had got really angry with me and thought the principal stuff was wishy-washy, I took myself off to a conventional counsellor. And I did that for, um, I did that twice this year. I did it at the beginning of the year when it was a little bit helpful. And I did it again in the summer when I took another dip. And I'll, as I took a dip, our relationship took another kind of new low. And... I worked with this lady for a couple of months in the summer and I got to a point where I was kind of, I don't know where to go with her advice. And I missed some of what you were saying, So The last bit I heard was about, I need to sit down with him and have a conversation, something along those lines. And that's 
very much where I was with Alan. I kept sitting down and saying, we need to have a chat. We need to have a conversation. We need to sort things out. And I was very kind of like insistent on it. And every time we did it, it was an absolute disaster. And around that time, I started to kind of pick up the three principles again. I started reading bits and looking at videos. Um, I started joining the community group again. And I started to really understand that I was responsible for me and what Alan was doing was what Alan was doing and it wasn't personal to me it was it it was it was his stuff it wasn't mine and it started to affect me less and I would just not join in with it I would just kind of like walk away from it I'd just be quiet I didn't react to it I just kind of took myself away from it and gradually it started to calm down without me doing anything and without us having any conversations about what we should and shouldn't do and I I was in turmoil for about 18 months about whether I should whether we should split up whether we should get divorced and I needed to make this decision but actually when I started to kind of be different and understand things differently we didn't need to have a conversation it just started to sort of settle down by itself um and sort of again around the same time I brought a book called the relationship handbook by one of the Pranskis I can't remember which one and Alan is very very anti-counselling, would never go to anything like that, thought it was a waste of time. He picked up this book and he said, oh, this is really interesting. And he said, finally, something that actually makes sense. He was so anti-counselling and I can actually understand that, um, understand why now. Um, and then he came to the uh, the in-person retreat that Jenny and Dave did um, towards the end of last year. And he did have some understanding about it before that. And we never made any decisions about what to do or we didn't talk about how to make things better. We just changed within ourselves somehow. Um, And no one is more surprised than me that 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 happened. Um, So, yeah, I just wanted to sort of say sometimes, uh, Jenny, you were saying something about decisions and you just know when you need to make them or sometimes it just unfolds and I think it just unfolded in in a way that I wasn't expecting and I I wonder whether that was because it wasn't forced it I wasn't trying to make anything happen although I tried very hard for 18 months to kind of make it all better and have lots of conversations and sort things out which was all very counterproductive. Um, So I don't know if that helps, but I just thought I'd share. Thank you. Beautiful, love. Thanks, Ali, love. Mona, you've got your hand up. Mona Dalgleish. Kate. (laughs) Mona, I just got it. Um, I was just going to say it's funny because um, can my mute um, because you know Sarah's heard we've had you know different conversations and Sarah's heard me saying uh, look you just don't need to react but actually that's not what I'm saying it, it's funny how you don't hear we don't hear each other and I'm always noticing what people don't hear when I say something because actually. You know, when you do react, like I react all the time to, uh, you know, different relationships, like with with my kids or with Georgia or with Pete. And it's not like there isn't any right and wrong in this. It's just so much more about noticing when you're reacting, because when you're reacting, you're you're in the same. uh, You're in the story, you know, with the other person. And sometimes there doesn't seem, you know, you're in your ego and sometimes you don't see a choice, you don't see it. And, um, you know, my sister was saying, cause she was, you know, when, when her husband 
who can be quite um, explosive and um, whatever. And she said, but Kate, you know, I, I try and, you know, I know that I should be more loving and I shouldn't react, but I don't want to be loving when he's angry, you know, and he'll push me away or I don't want, you know, and then, you know, and it's, it's like, you know, it's, this isn't about what you should and shouldn't be. And sometimes in the moment when it's all kicking off, you don't feel like giving the other person a hug. You don't feel like, you know, because you're also in the sort of same place that they are. And then, you know, you start to see that when this, it's not always in that moment that you, you connect with this space within you, which is love. And then everything looks different. Then you see that you didn't have a choice other than to react. And they also can't see a choice. You know, you start to see that when people are off in their story and they're believing everything and they're angry and they're whatever, they don't, in that moment, they don't see a choice. They're not doing it to hurt you. They're not doing, you know, no one can hurt you. But in you, when you start to see that, like when, you know, like you said, Bill Pettit says, you know, if we could see a different choice in whatever moment, then we would probably take a different path, but we don't see a different choice. So, you know, we just do what is available given the level of awareness that we're in, in that moment. But as you start to trust this space within you, then you, you get woken up more and more by your feelings because you're like, why am I reacting the way I am? It's never coming from the other person. You don't need to change the other person. It's not about that. It's not about having to manage someone else. It's always going back to what am I doing? Why am I reacting the way I am? And then you sort of, you become less attached to the story yourself and you fall into this space of love. And I really noticed something yesterday with um, when Christine said that love is wisdom. And again, I love this understanding because it, just for me it's you know this seed that grows within you it's not about doing and trying it's just allowing it to grow and then you hear things and I'm sure I've heard that before but this time I heard it within me and it was like my seed had a little growth spur again because I was like oh so <laughs> love is wisdom wisdom is love because when you connect to that space within you, which is just your, your, your true self. And you feel, you see that the other person doesn't have a choice. You see it's not personal and you connect to that space within you. And then, you know, you do, you connect to this incredible wisdom and you know what to say, you know what to do. Sometimes it's to say nothing. Sometimes it's to, to, to allow them to, to be in there, whatever they're in. And then, you know, and that can go on for days, <laughs> but you know that they're gonna be fine. You know, they'll be learning in whatever storm they're in. And you know, you don't have to manage it. And you know, you don't have to fix it. And you don't have to tell them they're doing life wrong because that's what they're gonna hear when you're trying to manage it. And then you see that when you're connecting with this wisdom, you see that all there is is love. And then you realize love and wisdom is the same thing, which I hadn't seen before yesterday. So that was, that was, yeah, that was my little growth spot yesterday. But it was interesting that, you know, it is, um, I'm not saying don't react. I'm saying notice when you are, if that makes sense. And give yourself a break. Yes. We're so fucking hard on ourselves. Mm. There's a lot of nodding going on. We're so we're so we're so hard on ourselves. I said it's funny watching Dave with Rusty because pretty much every day Rusty bites Dave. Rusty Dave will go over to like give him a stroke or um, he wants to get up on the sofa so Dave cause he, he can't do it anymore. So Dave will help him and. He gets growled at, he gets bitten. Like, it's just almost like he doesn't like you a lot of the time. And I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, Dave just carries on and is really loving towards him. 
And then sometimes you do take it a bit personal. Like, Fuck off. Yeah. I'm trying to help you. But I said he's been such a, a great teacher for you because you have no idea, like it's easy to see it, like in the little Jack Russell, you've got no idea what's going on in his world. We're always trying to guess what he needs or what he wants and and he just reacts and is, is an angry, an angry. Well, he, he reacts in different ways at different times. So sometimes he can be really loving and kind to me. You know if you're on Rusty's good books because if he can reach, so you have to be on the floor or he'll come and walk up and he'll just give you one single lick on the end of your nose. It's one Always on the end of your nose, never on your hand, never on it, anywhere else, just on your nose. And then other times he has bitten my nose. You know, it's like my character changes within Rusty. He is just the same as us. He is the same force of life that we are. One of the things, one of the things that came to me, I was going to say was my dad and I had a very hard time growing up together. Two stags in a house. And when I got together with, when I split with Rach, my wife, my family took it very hard. I was with Rach for 13 years. And she lived with you for eight or so. And she lived with us for 13, yeah, lived with the whole family for eight or so years. And anybody who meets Rach, they meet an angel. She's, a, she's one of the most beautiful human beings you could meet. She's stunning. Gentle, kind, compassionate, intelligent. She's beautiful. And when we split up, nobody could understand why. I couldn't understand why. Where I got feelings for somebody else and I don't know. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I didn't know what to end. That's why I ended up feeling suicidal. And my family didn't know what to do. So they did the best thing that they could do at the time. And that was to shut me out. And like my mum said, though, my dad was probably the, the kindest at that time. And then I got together with another girl. And I was with this girl when Jenny and I met. And when we got together, I was with this girl. And my dad loved this girl too. So my family, my dad loved Rach, loves Rach. And he loved this other girl called Manda. And I went home and I, I said, I'm a farmer for Jenny. And my dad stomped around, when are you going to stop doing this? When are you going to stop doing this? Do you not realise the impact it has? And all that came to me at the time was, fuck off. This is my life. I'll fall in love with whoever I fall in love with. Leave me alone. It's got nothing to do with you. It's got nothing to do with you. We had this massive bust up. Dad stormed off out. As happens, when we have an argument or we get irate, we calm down. How do we calm down? Do we make ourselves calm down? No. The mind quietens itself all the time. The mind quietens itself and my mind quietened. And I got to see this situation objectively. My dad's really sad. He loved Rach. Your daughter, she was like his second daughter. And he said that. And he loved Manda. Loves both. Yeah, I know. He loved her. And with that, I got an insight. I saw my dad differently. My dad wasn't his behaviour. My dad's behaviour was coming from a, a grief, a sadness. And so with that, I remember I walked through into the sitting room where he was sat watching telly and I said, Dad, 
I know you love Rach. I said, and I'm glad and I want you to. I always wanted to be in your life. I said, and I know you love Manda. And I want you to. I always wanted to be in your life. I said, go out for meals together. Go, you know, go out for, go out for cups of coffee together. She's welcome around here anytime. I said, but dad, there's somebody new coming into your life who you can fall in love with. You don't have to lose anybody. You can have another person in your life who you can love. And my dad loves Jen. And he loves Manda. And he loves Rich. We didn't lose anybody. Rach, my ex-wife, is a very dear friend of ours. We've been away on holiday together. My family and her family, she's got two kids now and a husband, a beautiful husband who's just fits into our family like a glove. We all love him. We're grateful to have him in our lives. Manda is one of our best mates. We went to a marriage... She, you and her are constantly texting each other and talking to one another. She comes around her house with a new husband now, and we all have tea together. We haven't lost anybody. Relationships aren't always easy. The idea that relationships shouldn't be difficult, that is a belief that will cause suffering, and it is a belief that will cause discomfort. It shouldn't be like this. The moment we resist what is, we're into friction. Friction burns. Relationships are challenging sometimes. You've got two different realities that both look very, very real. So compellingly real, we'll argue with them. That's why we try and raise awareness of this, this point. So we can navigate these situations easier when we remember. Arguments do happen. Jen and I don't always see eye to eye. Remember one argument we had, and Jen decided she was going to try getting angry. It was hilarious. You laughed at me. <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh. And then within five minutes, we were just laughing our heads off and give each other a hug and a kiss. Sorry about that. Let's get back on with it. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because <laughs> anger doesn't come very often. It's not an, a, a, a response that seems to come up in me very often. I don't really. Like you get enraged about things and it's just not, I don't know. And yeah, I tried, but. It was crap. It's funny, so I've got Rusty and you in my life. Yeah. And, but what I've learned is like over the first couple of years we were together, we traveled a lot and we did a lot of driving back and forth between the North and the South. And sometimes we'd do it two or three times in the week and That's spent cool. hours on the M6 and during that year I think we got to know each other better and better and I think you're able to be just I don't know I don't think you sort of held it in as much and sometimes you'd get really fed up and annoyed with traffic and like be effing and blinding or and I would be like oh my god I don't know what to do I want to get out of the car this is horrible I don't know I don't know how to handle this and I'd I'd almost, I knew it wasn't directed at me, but I just didn't want to be around it. I'd find it really, really difficult. And I remember saying to you the time that it happened and I still sat in a really peaceful space. And I just thought, bless you, it must be horrible to have to experience that. I'm so grateful I don't have to have that experience. Like, I don't find traffic that annoying. I don't really, you do more of the driving than me, definitely, like 90% of the driving, but sat in traffic, however long it takes, it takes. It doesn't really bother me. Other people's poor driving doesn't really bother me. It's not something that comes to mind. And it was a really brilliant thing because I think 
growing up, my mum was quite explosive and I used to just take myself away from it. I couldn't be around explosive, angry people. I'd find it too much. I'd find it too difficult. And I thought it made me feel bad and it made me feel insecure and it made me feel scared. And it's been brilliant to see that actually my feeling of peace and well-being isn't tied into Dave's. And then that allows me to be much, much kinder. Objective. And because I think I used to be a bit judgmental, a bit like Christine Heath said, well, I thought you'd had this amazing experience and I can't believe you're getting angry. You shouldn't because you understand something about life. And I got, I would feel judgmental inside. And you start to see that the discomfort I was feeling was coming from my own mind about how I thought somebody should be or how I wanted them to be. But actually, when I then got to be around the same behavior in a completely different feeling, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm a closed loop. I can only experience my own mind. And as my mind changes, my reality changes, everything looks different. And like I was saying today, it's really good that in the middle of the night, when Rusty has us up sometimes five or six times a night, sometimes he's pacing, sometimes he wants a drink, sometimes he's eating loads of stuff that he's found out on walks, so we need to go to the toilet, like all kinds of reasons. I said, it's so lucky that one of us is always able to be like, come on, he's a little dog. Because the other one's like, oh, just, I can't believe this again. I, I just need to sleep. But one of us seems to keep our sanity. <laughs> I've got the time when both of us lose our sanity. He's dead, isn't he? He's it? dead. He's getting <laughs> punted out the window. Get out. Bless him. But I remember on one of our drives, I've mentioned this so many times, but it was a real insight for me. And when Jen and I first got together, it was it was complicated and it was difficult and we copped a lot of judgment, especially from the three principles community. We got an awful lot of judgment. People were writing things about us on Facebook and we shouldn't be allowed to share what we share. We don't live the life that we talk about. And we never speak about how to live a life. That's not my job. It's not my job to decide how somebody else should live. So we never give advice. We don't tell anybody how to live. We don't tell people it's just a thought, so you should be able to see past it. No, we're saying it's all thought, and it's frigging deceptive. And we, we're quite humbled to life because we've been humbled to life. We've tried the arrogant route, and it humbled us, and it humbled us again, and it humbled us again. I remember driving down, and driving down to London, this was, we are going to a conference. Well, you were speaking at a, a women's conference, weren't you? No, it's a big conference. Oh, it was it a big one? And I'd not been feeling that connected to Jenny. I was like, I could feel this kind of disconnection, you know, where you just look at somebody and it's just not there. The spark isn't there. I just felt it for a couple of weeks and I got to the point where I'm like, I'm going to say something. I'm going to bring this out into the open. So on the drive down, I said to Jen, Jen, look, I need to talk to you. She's like, what's up? I said, forgive me if you've heard me say this before. But I said, I'm not feeling it. This relationship, I'm not really feeling it. It's like, there's not really anything there. The spark feels like it's gone and quite difficult. And Jen said to me... And you said, and I feel so much pressure to make it work. Oh, so I, feel, I feel so much pressure to make this work. Because of all the upset, of course. Yeah. Your dad was deeply unhappy with me, wasn't he? And yeah. Some deeply unhappy people. And Jen said, oh, you feel that too? I was like, yeah. She said, sometimes I get that feeling, Dave, of disconnection. She said, sometimes I look at you and I want to rip your clothes off. She said, and other times I look at you and I just think, no. Nah. 
I'm sure you've made up that first bit. No, that's what you said. (laughs) Something about being the sexiest man in the world, greatest lover. Um, Worse than that, yeah, something like that. I said, and other times I just look at you and go, meh. And I was like, you get that too. She said, yeah, of course I do. She said, do you want to know the difference between me and you though, Dave? I said, what's that? She went, you think it is a reflection of our relationship. She said, I know it's a reflection of my mind. We carried on driving down to London. The magnitude of that statement didn't hit me till we got into bed together that night. I got into bed, I lay with Jen and I was looking at her. And suddenly I started laughing my head off. And Jen said, what are you laughing at? She said, I said, I've just had a massive insight. And it was a, it was a massive insight. She said, what was it? I said, don't have a clue. Nothing I could talk about. But Jenny changed in front of my eyes and I fell so deeply in love with her. Bang, like that. From that one shifting consciousness shifted an entire reality. Out the way, gone. That's how this works. Bless you, then you spun off, saying... But I thought we've been doing so well for the last two weeks that I can't believe you were feeling like that. I'd never felt more connected to you. I thought we were so connected. And I thought I was, I was, I thought I was quite intuitive and I could get a feel for where the other person was at. So I'm like, God, my judgment must be completely wrong. But yeah, and then we learn from that. We learn. You know, look at, look at life. It's a fascinating thing. We have this capacity to learn to remember, to be able to utilize previous experience and bring it into the now. And sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not, it requires discernment. But we have this gift of learning. And if you notice, we learn from birth till death. We learn, it's not without purpose, isn't learning. It's absolutely fundamental. It's required in life to be able to learn. So it's done. So we do. The learning is so important. Open minds learn. Closed minds don't. When I'm in my self-righteousness, my mind's not opened. You're a dickhead. I'm a dickhead. <laughs> I'm like, Dave, please shut your mouth. Please don't speak now. I see it coming and then I'm like, yep. There He's it comes. seen it as a green light when actually it was a red light. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice just to, then that's just, that's what's happening. I used to have such judgment for myself. Such judgment for Losing my shit. It doesn't happen very often. I used to do it every single day. I used to lose my shit. Somebody, something, smash something up. Now, I don't know. Once every 1.1 days. <laughs> no, it just doesn't happen as regularly as what it did. I think you've probably seen me lose my rag in seven, six years, seven years. Six years. Six years, six, seven times. But I'd say there's like three main times and the other times were sort of half attempts. Hmm. I think the other thing that occurred to me is because we have done so many long drives together, we'd be sat and I could look over and be like, oh God, I'm so grateful we're, we're together and I'm so grateful. And we made it. We made it and I just thought we'd be squeezing each other's hand and just listening to music and three hours into the drive. I might remember something you've done that's pissed me off or I might think about something that's happened or, and I can look over and be like, well, actually, I'm a bit thicker. <laughs> but you can see like nothing has changed. <laughs> but your mind has brought thought. 
and there's something that happened very early on in our relationship which I could bring to mind and I'd almost make out that you're like an like an enemy almost like this person's out to get me and then one thought later what am I thinking we're, we're amazing together I love our relationship and you see like City to say we're we're all schizophrenic he said because we can think this and then think this and think this and we all think it's all real it appears real every single one every single reality appears real but when you start to get a feel for that I remember um, having a conversation with uh, Dr Keith Bevins once when I was taking him to an airport and I was just saying to him I said I don't quite know how to put it into words but I'm starting to get a feel for when I'm like I'm on the I'm aligned with what's true and from that space I can make brilliant decisions or they do just unfold and I said I'm getting a feel for when I'm really off kilter and that actually I, anything that comes to mind is probably not to be trusted right now and I said I, I can't I said it's not as mechanical as that but it's, you start to feel the difference in those spaces and I know Dickon tells us to, I've just realized Kelly's had her hand up for ages Kelly has yeah she's put it down now oh. she had her yellow hand up in the corner I did, but carry on. It's fine. <laughs> well, no, go, because you, you, you had it. Go. Yeah, we've got 10 minutes. This is your time. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to kind of... I've kind of been debating whether to say anything like the whole time we've been on, because I've had this kind of like situation that's been going on over the whole weekend. I don't know. Like, I'm trying to have that feeling that I have in the principles that I've had many times, and I kind of want to drop into that space. But then behind that door, in very at various times, there's been a war raging outside the, the lounge door, or whatever room I'm choosing not to be in, and it's to do with to, to do with particularly again my eldest son. He moved out of the house for quite well, nearly two months, and he came back this weekend, which was obviously quite a tricky time to try and do a retreat when a when a troublesome soul has returned to the house. Um, but I've been trying to sort of stay with you guys. But I know I'm the feeling is I can feel I'm out of kilter. And it's been, to be fair, since since he moved out, it's been really, it hasn't, it didn't really offer any relief, him not being here, because he was actually at my mum's house and she's a lot more triggered by some of the stuff that he does <laughs> than I would be. And so, so not only have I had to worry about him being at my mum's house also then my getting it in the ear from my mum about what's going on and now he's moved home and he only he only sort of moved home yesterday in the afternoon and um well, he's been in and out of the house and even like this morning I've had my other my other son come to me and say well he's just done this he's just done that he's just done this in my room and you know, I want to say things like, well, let's not let's not talk about his character like that. And let's not invest in those stories because they were the stories from before. Let's start afresh. Let's have some new thinking and, you know, try and bring in some of the things that I have, you know, that I felt that I deeply learned throughout this time of kind of knowing about the three principles, you know. And yet I can't I am feel like I've got a bunch of butterflies like, in my chest just waiting for something to happen and just sort of already and then other people come coming in to, and speaking to me and saying well you should be doing this you should be doing that I'm shooting all over myself anyway but then on top of it I'm getting other people's shoulds because because of the things that this particular child does seem quite extreme to a lot of people to find that to, to, the, to a lot of people and to myself to find that space of love without judgment when there's a massive history of kind of behavior that is uh you know violence and theft and screaming and shouting and just various other things that are quite difficult to deal with and so I'm trying to be here in this retreat and yet I've only got to go and open that door and there's a situation sort of brewing and so I'm in two so I'm kind of feel like I'm straddling two worlds so I'm hearing what you're saying but I'm really finding it difficult for it to drop into me at the moment because I feel like I'm not in a place to hear it almost. 
so it's quite an interesting frame of mind to be in and try and and to listen to the principles and to sort of feel I'm kind of hop in between these different places that, that which which one is which one is real you know is real the the love or is real the situation yeah he has just done all those things since he's been home I don't know I don't even I don't even know how to I haven't I haven't said anything because I don't even know how to express it I don't even know how to ask for support I don't even know what I'm asking for or what I'm hoping to you know, I keep feeling like I'm listening for something that's just going to make it. Oh, that's the that's the that's the penny that's dropped. Oh, that's the understanding. I, it seems to be elusive to me at the moment because I've got this. I feel it's all in my sort of. I feel it very physically. It's elusive because you you're wanting it to come from this retreat. Yeah. Your answer cannot come from this retreat, love. This your answer is going to come from you. Yeah. It's the only way this this is this is what we're trying to say. You've got the power to negotiate this. No, life's not always easy. Just life to... is not always a bed of roses. Sometimes life is fucking hard, desperately hard. I just feel like it's just been, you know, I've been kind of been feel like I've been doing the doing the things that that I kind of should be doing on my... They say, this is it. This is it. I know. You're doing all the things you think you should be doing. You've already lined up your... You've already lined it up. When this happens, I'm going to respond like this. When this happens, I'm going to say this. Should this happen, I'm going to say this. You're not present. You're not in the moment. No. Yeah, and then you're listening for, the, like listening for an answer or listening for an insight. So then you don't really get to hear. But it's cool that you've seen that. And I think all I've heard in what you've said is there's a huge amount of awareness of I'm shooting all over myself. I'm trying to listen for a, something. I'm trying to hear something in this retreat that will help me. Like there's so much awareness that I don't think you necessarily would have had before. Mm. So you, you, you can't stop the and you can't stop the physical response you have in your body. Mm. But you have that awareness. And I know that when we've had conversations before, you have touched that place where you're like, I know there's some truth, there's, there's truth in this, in this. And you've felt it and you've seen the difference in your life. Yeah. And then you have got the contrast of like being caught up in the world of form and how that feels. But I kind of know that when you pop out of it, you've always learned something. Yeah, this is the thing. I mean, it feel it feels to me as if I've been in this kind of rut, this kind of place for, since the twenty fourth of December. But then when I look back over that, and I know that that isn't actually true, um, because there's been some massive moments of clarity in that time, and there's been moments of love. But it just is this underlying thing of this, this this situation that I've got to that I've got to kind of be the person who who solves it out of all of the people that are involved in the situation, the other family members and stuff that it falls on me to solve it somehow. And, and I just don't know how to, and I, and, and I don't like it in myself when I know that I'm involved in a, when I'm involved in this kind of game inside my head of trying to find some sort of answer. Um, Is it I'm not, in the moment, really, I'm projecting no. a fear of it because of the history of the situation, I'm projecting that into tomorrow and the next day and the next weeks and the next year. This is it, you know. It's like when I met Alex. I was present with the situation. I didn't go in with the, oh, thankfully, I didn't go in with the, oh, when if should somebody try and take some money with, from me, I'm going to batter them. I was present in the moment. Mm. sometimes being present in the moment is you get straight with people that's not acceptable mm. that is not acceptable sometimes being present in the moment is you know there are no wrong emotions nature doesn't make mistakes we are nature these are nature emotions 
Yeah. You know, sometimes being present is to get straight with people. Sometimes being present is just to sit back and bide our time. There's no prescription. And Jenny and I don't offer advice. No. And we, the reason why we don't offer advice is because if we offer you advice, one, you're not listening to yourself. Two, we don't know the situation like you do. No. It just, yeah. I'm just so, t- you know, it just fit. I just feel really exhausted from it. Yeah, I can imagine. Love. It's just, I feel like everyone's looking to me to have the answer. Like I've got some sort of magic wand and I can just make this situation okay with him and he's not going to take their stuff and he's but, not going to scream is, it out. But is, but is that true? No. No. And maybe mm. the expectation is for me to be able to do that on so myself. What? I know that other people aren't expecting me to, me to be able to. Right. When I, when I was in the tree work, it's a well-known fact that a tree out on its own in the middle of a field is susceptible to fungal attack. Yes, they grow big and they grow majestic and everybody loves them, but they, they are weaker than the cooperate, cooperative state of a woodland. They're more vulnerable. Because within the woodland, there's fungal, fungal um, funguses that will um, attack the honey fungus and whatnot. That um, that will attack the the isolated woodland tree uh, um, field trees. You know, nature is a massive cooperation. And Cal, if you're trying to do this all by yourself, you're going to wear yourself out. Yeah. We are. I said this to a member of our family this week. We are family because we work through things together. It's a co-operation. And when we come together, you know, we can share the responsibility. No, life. Life's not a. It's not. It's a solo journey, but it's a solo journey of many. And we can help one another. Don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, you learn this stuff. It is not an anesthetic to life. You will feel and you will experience. In fact, most of the time, people feel deeper. They will feel deeper at both ends of the spectrum. Microphone's on. They'll feel deeper at most both ends of the spectrum. But it's because they're opening up and allowing themselves to. That keeps talking to me specifically at the moment. Is that Kate? Yeah, she's coming from school. Hi, I love. Hi. Hi. Hiya, sweetheart. Hi. <laughs> you see. Expectation. Friggin' hell, that'll that creates so much dissatisfaction. Comparison. What do they say about comparison? It gives killer of joy. <laughs> thief of all joy. I should. I should have. All these things that we do to ourselves. Kel, just be present. See what's going on and trust yourself. Yeah. You've got it. But if you go in with a preconceived idea of, I know how I should be, you're not present. No. You're not responding to the moment and you're not responding to what's happening. You are, you're living in a la-la land. The thing is, I sometimes sort of feel that when I respond from that place of, as a, as a reaction to something that's just happened that I'm kind of in a, I'm not in a, I'm in a quite triggered part of my, I'm quite triggered at that point that maybe that isn't the place I should operate from. And so therefore I won't say anything right now. I'll just, 
suck it up. That's what makes sense to you, love. It, the only thing is I'm at that point now where I don't know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. I'm in that place. Yeah. You know, maybe two weeks ago or a week ago, I wouldn't have been in that place. I was place just going to say, it's 10 to go and get a cup of tea or yeah. a drink, everyone. When we'll, you come conti- back, we'll continue this conversation another time. Carol. Yeah, but come back and Linda's a beautiful, um, be- beautiful speaker. If you can come back and just listen like yeah, it's such a cliche now, but everyone says it. Like you're listening to music, you're just listening to it for the for the hell of it, not to get anything from it, and then just see, see. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come, definitely we'll have a- we'll have crack on. Break time, everyone. We're coming back at four o'clock UK time, which is now about twelve minutes away. Okay, go and get a brew. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you all for a wonderful three days. It's the very, it's the finale. We're on the home straight. (laughs) I'm the fireworks. You are the fireworks. We now bring you the fireworks. Beautiful. No, we absolutely... We've absolutely lo- loved having Linda on in the past. Special lady to both of us. I just want to say a little bit about this retreat before we make a start. Um, Jen and I are doing this retreat via donation. We have done, we recorded the whole thing. They're on our website. People are free to go and watch it. It's free to watch. When I say it's free to watch, it's there. If you don't want to donate anything, it's there and you're allowed to watch it. But what we ask is if people find benefit from this, if they enjoy it, if they, if they, um, please make a donation to Freedom Thinking. We do this via donation at this point in time because we want to make it accessible to people, people who can afford to pay. We'd love it if you could make a donation. But we are aware that people are also in a position where they're not in a in a. Uh, a position to be able to to spend any money and they're perhaps tight um, tight up against it so what we say about that is please please use this please use these videos please watch them watch them again and again share them um but if you're not in a position to pay we ask that could you please pay it forward with an act of kindness mm. could you please do something for somebody who perhaps need some help it could be anybody use your imagination and we ask that we go above and beyond not just give a couple of quid to a homeless person like go above and beyond and help make somebody's day help create a more beautiful world through an act of kindness so that's the freedom thinking via donation retreat Um, details of how to make donations are on our website freedomthinking.co.uk um and now we do we do we have the fireworks we've got a beautiful lady um i know some of you have listened to linda before and if you haven't you're in for a treat no pressure you're in for a treat <laughs> <laughs> do you want to say this? just thank you for being here and um just yeah thank <clears throat> you for saying yes immediately and I know I said to you, the last retreat that you spoke at was just, it was, it was wordless, whatever it, I felt when you were speaking. And, um, and I love how free you are mm. with what you share and how I love that. in the moment you're not restricted by any form of what you think it is or should be. It feels so free. And, I, and I've loved that. And um, yeah, I have a great respect for how you share and you're true to yourself rather than, any form of understanding or or way. Um, and I also want to let people know, Linda has donated her yeah. time. She's donated to be her a time speaker. for free to this. God bless her. So thank you. And I'm gonna shut up so you have you have the floor. We've given an hour and a half, Linda. <clears throat> but it's up to you. Okay, so um, I sometimes lose track of time. So wave at me or <laughs> So I know to sort of wrap up, but I would hope 
I'd really love this time with you all to be as interactive as possible. So if you, if you, I'm going to, I'm actually going to ask for your participation, but if there's something you want to share or a question you have to ask, I do have my chat message open and Jen and Dave, please feel free to kind of clue me because sometimes when I'm looking around my screen, I don't see something. Um, I try to keep my focus on the camera. So it seems like I'm looking at you uh, rather than looking at your lovely, lovely little pictures. So I wanna welcome you all. I see some people I have met before uh, and I'm delighted to see you again. And I see many names that I'm not at all familiar with. So <clears throat> just by way of introduction, um, I've been a helping professional for most of my career. I, I actually started out in public relations. I was in communications for eight years and then found my way into counseling and psych psychology and lived there as my home for over 30, 35 years. And now I share the three principles understanding and I primarily share it with helping professionals. And I'm deeply grateful that I found the understanding. Um, most of you probably know that I'm married to Bill Pettit, one of the longest standing teachers of the three principles. Uh, goes back to the very beginning with almost the very beginning with Sid Banks. And uh, people ask me how I deepen my grounding in the three principles that I love to say, because I slept with one of its <laughs> most well-known teachers. <laughs> and really, truly, he has been one of, if not the most primary teacher. Um, can, we, can we do that? Would it help us? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't allow it. <laughs> I keep him for myself. I did. I did because Bill and I, Bill and I met on Valentine's Day. So it's really kind of cool that I'm speaking about love. Um, we met and then we're married six months later. And because of that, I had the very, very good fortune of um, knowing Sid Banks and having actually serving him dinner in my home and getting to know him a little bit as a human being, as a person and visiting him on Salt Spring a number of times. And he would call our house weekly, just about weekly to have a conversation with Bill and uh, Bill primarily probably, but he never minded when I got on the phone and listened as well. So, and sometimes he called and spoke to me individually. So I try to share what I heard from him and I love going back and regrounding into the books and the videos he left behind. And that's my plan today is to just start with the two quotes of his from his books that mean the most to me and to have a discussion with you about them. The first one is from Second Chance, and I'd like to read it to you in his words. And it's actually spoken through the voice of Mama Leela his um, feminine teacher character. True love is pure spirit power being manifest. The manifestation can take many forms. There is a mother loving her child, a doctor caring for his patient, a father playing with his children, a child playing with a new puppy, people caring for the less fortunate. Love is a positive feeling and if people cultivate this feeling in their lives, they will surely free themselves. Isn't that interesting? They will surely free themselves from any unbalanced conditions that surround them. Wise words for those of us traveling now on this beautiful planet uh, in the trouble that it's in. Love is not just an idea. So here's the essence of it. Love is not just an idea. Love is a living, breathing essence that the wise can pluck from the air at will and then like a master artist, mold it into something beautiful. Love, 
my dear Richard, makes the impossible possible. So I wanna kind of sit with that for a little bit and take it apart with you, see what you see in it. So let's start with the beginning. Love is not just an idea. Love is a living, breathing essence. I think the moment I saw that with crystal clarity was actually before I came to the three principles understanding. It was at the deathbed of my father-in-law from my first marriage and he had just passed and, and I loved him so dearly. He, he was just a beautiful, beautiful man, very simple. He was a milkman. He'd been a milkman for 40 years. For 40 years, he'd woken up at three o'clock in the morning to go deliver milk to his customers around the city of Detroit, Michigan. And he loved his customers. He loved talking to them. He loved serving them. He would not have missed his route for anything because it would have meant putting them at a disadvantage. And when Jim died, um, I felt his spirit pass through my body. It was the most incredible thing. It was just this moment of feeling like this energy was upsweeping to the heavens, just swept through me. It was only in seconds, but it was profound. And then he visited me later that night in a very distinct way. It was, it was pretty amazing. But the thing that's the moral of the story for me was as I was leaving his hospital room, I turned around over my shoulder to look at his body lying on the bed. And I was just so struck that the body was just, uh, it, it was just inanimate. It, it was, it, it had still had a heart. It still had a liver, still had, I could see his toes. It's, it still had a face, but the essence the living, breathing essence that he was, was no longer there. The living, breathing essence that he was, the love that he was, was no longer there. And the body looked so fragile and so heavy, like a discarded rumpled costume on a theater stage. And I marveled at that. I still marvel at that. That to me, when I think about what mind is, what Sid calls mind, which he, a word he uses interchangeably with love, that's what I think of when I think of that phrase that love is a living, breathing essence. It's an animating force that we all are, that every tree is, every flower is. Everything we see in nature is, every thought is a living, breathing essence. So I just want to sit with that with you for a minute and see if any of you want to share anything that has come to your minds. Don't be shy. Hi, Linda. Hi, Lisa. Hi, I'm Dave, sister. How are you? Oh, hi, Dave, sister, Lisa. Hi. I'm hi. great. Pleased to meet you. Um, lovely to meet you, too. I've heard some really nice things about you, actually. Um, and that's why Linda's coming on. She's absolutely lovely. I love her. So um, I'm actually going to have to leave in 10 minutes, but it was so nice to hear what you just said, because I had a really similar experience when my dog died who I loved beyond, you know, love. And it came to the time when, when we had to put him to sleep. And um, I talk about this quite often because it was such a huge revelation that I never thought I would put my dog down because it was against my ethos to do that. And I would let the life force in him go. But before I knew it, the I'm, I'd made the decision to put him to sleep because it was, it was desperately ill and then I realized that I am that essence I am the life force I am the essence of life so whether he whatever happens it was correct but had the same experience where 
once he'd passed away, I got engulfed. And I love the way you put it in this uplift of love. And I got this warm bubble all over me. I was absolutely engulfed in it. And he was empty, absolutely void. He was not there. And when that uplift had come, I fell asleep for two hours and he was just lying there. And that showed me that there is more to this life will ever meet our eye. And that we, it, to me, it was a, it was the purest love I've ever felt. So when we buried him, it was just a vessel, this beautiful, beautiful vessel that would then continue to become life for something else. And yeah, I just wanted to share that because I've, I've had that feeling of when the spirit leaves the body and you ju it's just pure. Yeah. What a beautiful, really what, how beautiful it is that you could receive that, Lisa. Oh. That you could, that you could receive that and know that, that, that you are that. You are yeah. that energy in motion. You, yeah. as Miguel Luis Ruiz says, you are that which blooms the rose. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. It was a, it, that whole journey was just peppered with realizations of, you know, like I wrote a thing and I've, I've said it in groups before about, I had a, a question as to whether to put Ben to sleep or not. And then the answer came and I didn't even know it till it was done. And I realized it comes from the same place. If we have a question, the answer comes when we're ready to receive the answer. And, and it all comes from the same place. It's all within us. And yeah, it was, it was a beautiful experience and I'm really grateful for it. Mm -hmm. So thank you thank for that. It's actually just reignited that kind of, oh, mm -hmm. even though it was like the heart most saddest thing, it was also mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful at the same time not what I expected <laughs> or I'd made up it would be like. Life's full of surprises. Thank you for that. That's very touching. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Sarah. Hi. Um, I was actually typing, but I'll, it's probably quicker if I just say it. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a combination of a few things that have happened today, actually. And um, when uh, Linda, in those two quotes that she started, thank you, Linda, very beautiful, um, beautiful quotes. Um, Love makes the impossible possible. And at the same time, I heard in me arising something that Dave said this morning from the, I can't remember who it was. It was a child that said to his granddad, you can't know what you don't know. And to me, life is hilarious. I can't remember who that was, Dave. But anyway, and, and then having witnessed, you know, my own confusion and Kelly's pain, her struggle at the moment, and just sort of seeing this interconnection that we think something is impossible because we're trying to fix it with our head, but actually the solution is love. So, so the mind, the intellect, is it's the wrong tool. And so your quote, Linda, you know, love makes the impossible possible. So when we drop into love, or wisdom, or wh whichever one of these words that we, truth, that we choose to use to point to what it is that we're talking about here, then we're not in the mind. And then that comes back to Dave's quote of, you can't know what you don't know. It's like you come into a whole different, it's like it's a whole different realm that you're operating within, and you what you need to do or what, what needs to be done or what decisions need to be made becomes clear without, and this, now I'm going back to Kate, who's another friend of mine in here and, you know, um, 
she says, it, you know, it, it, it's not, this is not hard work. Seeing something from a fresh perspective is not hard work. It's just a matter of turning your head in a different direction. Opening your eyes is not hard work. And just somehow those, your quote and this kid's quote, I can't remember who it was, Dave, just, yeah, and having witnessed my own sharing and Kelly's sharing, just, it all kind of, yeah, I think a lot of things just dropped into place. Thank you. Yeah, I could hear that, Sarah. It's kind of like a number of dominoes falling and yeah. something kind of on the edges of coming more clear for you. That's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Archie, yes. Yeah. You know, when I, there was a point where I had a conversation with Sid. Um, it was very brief. He, we were at a very small meeting on Victoria, in Victoria. And uh, he had been speaking to about 12 people. And I walked up to him afterwards and I, I said, Sid, in my psychology training, uh, love has been emphasized. I mean, Carl Rogers, the father of counseling, said that love was a, a sufficient condition for change to occur, that love did make the uh, impossible possible. And I looked at him and I said, so are you saying that love is enough? And he looked down, he got, his eyes got kind of misty and he looked up at me and he said, Linda, love and understanding are enough. And it was one of those moments when I wish I'd immediately blurted out, what the heck do you mean by understanding? But I, but I didn't, I, it would just, it just struck me, whoa, love and understanding are enough. Now, the way, the way I take that in for myself is that I, I have loved deeply all of my life. I remember my first memory, conscious memory, which probably was at age two and a half, is a memory of very deep love for my mother. I have known love and been conscious of love all my life and wanted to be a loving human being. But there were so many times when I was not. And when I came to this beautiful understanding that we're all discovering together anew, afresh every time we look at it, I suddenly saw the missing link. I saw that the only time I wasn't loving, the only time I wasn't in service to love, the only time I didn't remember that I was that living, breathing essence of love was when I was using the gift of love to think against myself, to stop myself. Because the only thing that can stop love is the power of our own personal thinking. And so understanding that freed me to love more because I knew what was happening in those moments when I forgot. It was just that momentarily I was caught up in what Sid would call a psychological virus, a thought thunderstorm, my ego, whatever you want to call it. And that was really beautiful. It answered a very deep fund fundamental question for me. If I am love, if I truly am a personification, a living manifestation of that living, breathing energy in the moment, if I am truly a divine thought on the mind of God, why don't I sometimes feel like it? Why don't I sometimes behave like it? Oh, because I'm using this incredible spiritual power and gift of thought in a highly idiosyncratic personal way. And innocently, I can get in the way of it. Bill and I had a conversation yesterday. We were talking about the different focuses of our work. And Bill said, you know, it's interesting. It's kind of like a lot of the focus of my work is, is helping uh, people to see how they're blocking themselves. <laughs> helping them see uh, how they're innocently misusing this beautiful spiritual power of thought and creating 
these conditions that we categorize and label as mental illness, or at least lack of mental well-being. And But Sid was really clear that the whole purpose of seeing that was to release love. And that's where you love to come in, Linda, is just talking about and expanding our understanding of what is behind this costume that we wear. So let's go a little further with this quote. Love is a living, breathing essence that the wise, the wise can pluck from the air at will. So plucked from the air, we can do something with it. We can use it. We can create with it. We are creators. Love is creative. Love, love is the power that creates families. Love is the power that creates the beautiful nature that we see. Love is the power that communicates across the vast web of the natural world. And we get to use it. And there's no creation that's any more important or special than any other. The creation of the mother who touches a child with love is magnificent. The creation of the father who sits with his son and makes something out of wood is magnificent. The creation of the custodian, like my grandfather, who swept the floors of a school in service to the children that he loved, is magnificent. The creation of a husband and wife, or two partners in love, two women, two men, it doesn't matter, is magnificent. The creation of a book is magnificent. The creation of just being who you are in the moment is magnificent. And there's no, there's no one creation that's any bigger or any better than any other. That's a huge fundamental mistake that we make as human beings. And it's Understandable, you know, as I spend a lot of time with my two and a half and four and a half year old grandchild, I, children, I see how easy it is for them to compare. Little Alex at two looks at what little, Al, little Luke at four and says, I can't do everything that Luke does. Little Luke looks at what Grammy or mama and papa can do and says, I can't do what mama and papa or Grammy do. And so these comparisons are just natural, but it's just human and it's just a way that we limit ourselves. We are incomparable. And when we know we're incomparable, when we know what we are, we're wise. When we don't, we're innocently foolish. And we, we, we fool ourselves and we fool others. I, 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 hope, I hope that you would walk away from this today, maybe a little more able to, or, or with a little gentle reminder to acknowledge yourself, to acknowledge who you are to acknowledge what you bring. This morning I had a funny thought. I, I put on um, stripes and as a human being, most of my life, I've, I've been a little wider than our standard of beauty. And when you're a little wider than the prevailing standard of beauty, one of the things they tell you is don't wear stripes. It makes you look even wider, but I love stripes, see my stripes? So I love stripes. And, and that's, that's a small, small thing, but it's a manifestation of something I love and I claim it.
I'm quiet and I claim that. Dave, did you want to say something? Linda, sorry, love, I was wa waving goodbye to uh, Kate. She's going to go pick oh, up. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah. Sorry, love. That's okay, it's perfectly fine. What do you love? Be that, be that more. Be it, be it flagrantly. Be it flamingly. I like bling. I wear bling flamingly. I like writing. I splash my words on the page and serve them. I like playing with my grandchildren and when they're here, the phone is nowhere in sight. I play with them with as much presence as I can muster and they teach me. Pluck love from the air in every second and be it fully. Mold it into something beautiful. Yesterday, I was listening to a, um, a brief sharing by a pretty renowned coach by the name of Steve Hardison. And he said something for me that was really, really powerful. He said, the power, all the power, all of the power is in the listener. All of the power that you're looking for is in the listener. And if you're, what he was pointing to is, you, you probably don't do this, right? You probably don't ever do this, but I do it. So I'm going to own this. If I'm sitting in the moment with someone like listening right now, and I'm thinking, oh, she's too blingy for me. Or, oh, she's too effusive for me. Or, oh, she's too whatever for me. Or, oh, he's too short. Or, oh, she's too fat. Or, oh, she's too quiet. Or, oh, she's not particularly attractive. Or all the bazillion kinds of thoughts we can have as we're sitting with another human being that that's, those thoughts are our experience of that person. <clears throat> we are not experiencing them. We are experiencing our thoughts. End of story. But if we are listening quietly, if we are listening beyond judgment, we will always hear brilliance. We will always hear diamonds. We will always hear gold. Because we are always sitting in the presence of pure love and motion. How many times have you cut yourself off or have I cut myself off from hearing when I'm sitting in nature or hearing when I'm sitting with my grandchildren or hearing when I'm sitting listening to a speaker, cut myself off from connecting with and hearing love and motion because I'm in judgment. I think that's one of the powerful things that Sydney Banks is pointing to here, that the wise can pluck love from the air at will. And then like a master artist molded into something beautiful. The beauty is in the listener. And if you are not hearing, seeing, feeling the beauty, you are cutting it off with your own thinking. It's a standard. It's a standard that I'm learning to live by, right? If I'm not 
experiencing the flow of beauty in the moment, seeing the flow of beauty in the moment. And in that moment, I'm just innocently experiencing my own thinking, just part of the human condition. But all I have to do is take the wax out of my ears, drop my thinking, and there the beauty is. <clears throat> I want to go on and talk a little bit about a second quote. Before I, do, before I do that, though, let me slow down and just say, does anyone have anything they'd like to share? You live. You live. That was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I really, really like that. Um, so many times been listening to someone else and thinking thinking things and yeah you don't hear them you're hearing what you're thinking <gasps> fantastic thank you so much love that thank you love thank you arena Um, I just love the use of the word essence it seems to come up a lot. I'm hearing it all the time. Um, and it's like it's that distilled pure love, which completely makes sense when you say like if we listen cleanly, we just we just experience love. It's uncontaminated, isn't it? I, mm -hmm. I, I just wondered if you had anything to add and what you've seen around that word or if there's any special significance for you. Yeah, thank you. I will definitely do that going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. That is so beautiful. I, I think of that often that we say it in different ways. Essence, true nature. I like love in motion. There was, when you were saying, Linda, <clears throat> what you do love, be it. I always, I always have to <laughs> I always have to give my little disclaimer right at the beginning of these statements I'm not religious right hang on I'm coming now all right Lisa cool. <clears throat> I'm not religious but I have a deeper respect growing and growing for the magic that has been around on this earth and spoken about for a couple of thousand years now and one of my favorite quotes is of Jesus Christ and it's in the book of Thomas and somebody asks Jesus how do you best serve God do you bring arms to church do you worship every Sunday how would you, how would you best serve God his answer was so simple and he just said, do that that you love. Mm. He said, just do that that you love. He was, a, he was a man who was aware. They were they were talking about the people who asked the question. They were talking about an external God, uh, a God of the mind, a God of creation of the mind, a God of thoughts. Yeah. And Jesus was speaking about the internal God. The creator within how do you best serve yourself do what you enjoy do what you love in life if you love your bling bling it if you love your stripes stripe it <laughs> yeah i love it Be Linda, <laughs> this is beautiful thank you sweetheart anybody else is there anybody else before we move on to the next bit i i just have to say that i think this is one of the sweetest cutest comments i've ever seen in a chat from lisa i'm going to switch to my mobile and take you to the supermarket <laughs> the idea that i'm being carried to this that's lace <laughs> that's lace <laughs> let's go oh, Asda. i'm on so my let's... way i'm on my way <laughs> you're coming to place just don't food. just don't put me under a watermelon it'll be fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> so let's go on to the second quote which is my just so powerful to me so in this, this is also a discussion with Mama Leela, 
and she's using the word aloha, the, a word used on the Hawaiian Islands a lot. And she makes the distinction, just so you know this, that aloha is love. Without aloha, we would be like children lost in the dark. We have truly been blessed with this priceless gift of aloha and it is ours to share. And then here's the essence. Love is a way of life, knowing intuitively what to do and when to do it, giving without thought of return or fear of need with great faith in the abundance of life. Let's break that down. First of all, I want to say that it, because it connects so beautifully to what Dave just said, that giving, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, this, I want to read this again, because to me, this is Sid's prescription for how to live. You know, he, he we often say he described how life worked. He didn't prescribe how you, you should use these beautiful principles that were given to make our way through life. But I think this is his offering, very gentle offering about how to live with deep happiness and contentment. Live in love. Love will help you know intuitively what to do and when to do it. Give without thought of return or fear of need with great faith in the abundance of life. And when we think of giving, most of us think about giving, giving of our talents, which is a way of giving, giving of our money, which is an exchange of energy. But I think there's a deeper message here that Dave just pointed to beautifully giving of what you love, giving from love, giving of who you are, giving whatever you see to give of yourself, giving yourself, pouring yourself out into life with true generosity of spirit. Whatever that means to you. People pour themselves out in so many ways. They pour themselves out in making beautiful foods for others to eat. They pour themselves out in changing bucky diapers. They pour themselves out in taking care of little pets. They pour themselves out in art, in writing. They pour themselves out, themselves out in a million different ways. And that's what I think we're being asked to do is scatter ourselves in a zillion beautiful sparks into this universe. We're all, we're all thoughts, beautiful thoughts on the mind of God. And we're all asked to be that thought to the fullest, to create with the thought that we are to the fullest. And every time we have a thought that compares, that downs, that says, I can't, I shouldn't, I mustn't, I'm not big enough, I'm not well enough, I'm not whatever enough. <clears throat> That's how we hold back our sparks. very innocent. But Sid is saying, just give, give without thought of return. As soon as a giving becomes transactional, it loses power. How many times have you and I given a compliment because we want to be liked? The compliment loses its power. But when we give out of pure acknowledgement of how much love we have inside and how much love we have for what's outside, that is powerful. That is true giving. Give without thought of return. Give without thought of return. You now it's like Jesus said to quote Jesus, if someone smites you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. Give without thought of return. Given the face of disapproval, given the face of judgment, given the face of, of uh, not being recognized, given the face of everything, just give because that's who you are. Give without fear of need. Just pour out your love. 
Love is a way of life, knowing intuitively what to do. I love, I love that Jenny and Dave used in the title of this beautiful event for you, Conjurers. What was it? What was it? Conjuring? Conjure? I love the word conjure. Everyday magic for the unwitting conjurer. For the unwitting conjurer. I love that. We're all conjuring, right? In the way we're listening and what we're hearing and what we're seeing and how we're giving. We're creating. We're conjuring. Every single minute of every single day. Well, what are we conjuring? What, what we live in shows us. What, what we live in shows us what we've conjured with our thinking. And yet we have this beautiful power to conjure beauty to conjure from truth, to conjure pure love. That's our birthright. And when, when we follow what I think of as the intuitive way of love, uh, we just know what to do because it's being guided for us from within. All the ideas we have. There's a beautiful place at the end of Second Chance where Oh, I think it's second chance. No, it's the end of In Quest of the Pearl, where Mama Leela says to the protagonist, throw your hopes and dreams to the heavens and someday the great one will sprinkle love on them for you. Well, where do hopes and dreams come from? I'm distinguishing when I think of hope and hopes and dreams from egoic desire. You know, I might have a really uh, a clear egoic desire to have, um, well, Bill and I were laughing about this. He has an egoic desire to someday in his life own a Porsche. We, thought, we saw a little one driving around yesterday that was white with a red top and he thought that was just the cat's meow, right? But he knows that's all that is. It's just an egoic desire, but a hope that the world can be a more mentally healthy place, a hope and a dream to write a book, a hope and a dream to create a beautiful picture, a hope and a dream to serve a child, a hope and a dream to work on behalf of a planet in need. Those things are God given. Those are divine thoughts. And that's, that's what I think Sid is pointing to, that, that we, if we know to listen to the still small voice within, if we know to listen to the intuitive guidance of divine thought, we will always just show up and do the right thing in the moment. Even though sometimes we don't know where it's going. I laugh. I was writing a piece for my writing class two and a half, three, almost three years ago. It was a silly little piece. It was actually an exercise that I was doing, but it just came to my mind to do. And I loved it. I loved following it. I had no idea that two and a half years later, it would become a pivotal chapter in the book that I've just written. Intuition often points the way, but it doesn't explain why. It doesn't show the final destination. It's a step. And people who live intuitively, who really trust the love within them and trust the guidance that comes with, from within them, know that. And they don't need to have the final answer because they trust that. They, they do what Sid points to in the last part of that quote. Have great faith, trust in the abundance of life. You know, one of the things that Sidney Banks said to me was the first time I met him, we were walking. And I was really curious about him <clears throat> as a human being. I knew he was a well-regarded mystic and spiritual teacher didn't know how deep a spiritual teacher he was at that moment, but I had respect for that. But I was really curious about just him as a person. And I said to him, I said, Sid, what is it like for you to share this beautiful understanding that you were given? 
I don't know what I expected him to say, but I didn't expect his answer. And he said, well, frankly, my dear, it's quite boring. And I said, what? You know, it wasn't what I expected. And he shook his head and he actually got tears on his cheeks. And he said, Linda, I keep saying the same simple things over and over and over again. That's the part that's a little boring. He said, but what's happening is that people are getting lost in the metaphor and mess, missing what I'm pointing to. And what I am pointing to is love. If you have, if, if, if the understanding of mind, thought, and consciousness move you more in the direction of a beautiful feeling, if your insights move you more in the direction of the beautiful feeling of love, you're on the right path. And you'll get there wherever there is, it's the unending there. But if you don't see something specific about mind, thought and consciousness, don't worry about it. What you're looking for is a beautiful feeling and the feeling is the guiding light. The feeling is the guiding light. That knowing of the rightness of something I could talk from now until the cows come home about all the intuitive experiences I've had in my life. I've been very conscious of intuition from the time I was very small. But probably one of the most incredible experiences of intuition that I've ever had was actually after I'd been on a retreat uh, on, with Native American medicine men on the desert here in the Southwest many years ago. And I was so filled with a beautiful feeling from it. So feeling a feeling of forgiveness for a lot of the pain I'd experienced in my life. And on my way home, I had a voice. I heard a voice and it just said to me, Linda, fear not. You are guided by unseen hands. And I, I think that's what this is pointing to, that everything in your life, that you're experiencing, no matter what it is, you are being guided through. And in a loving heart and a quiet mind, you will be guided through it. And it doesn't have to be a perfectly loving heart or a perfectly quiet mind. I don't know that I know what those are. But I do know that when I touch that little by little, I see the guidance. I've been guided through some truly awful human experiences, some truly difficult human experiences. And I've known what to do. Not, not big things, little things, little steps forward. I'm going to stop um, and just see if anyone has any thoughts, anything they'd like to share. Forgive me jumping around. Uh, Rusty's quite demanding and he's, he's wanted his tea. Then he's wanted to <laughs> let the thing out. <laughs> Linda, that was... <clears throat> That's been so beautiful so far. Mm. Told you would bring the fireworks there. <laughs> I've I, I've learned this the hard way, you know, really. Uh, that when I get stuck or when I feel lost or when I'm hurting or when someone else is around me is hurting and I want so much to help, that the best thing I can do is listen inward, listen, listen to hear what I'm being guided to do. You know, Bill sometimes calls them cue cards or love letters. 
I think of it best probably as the still small voice within that something that comes up and says, this is the next step, take it. And that requires recognizing it, noticing it, being conscious of it, and then having the courage, having the purity of heart to go for it, even though it sometimes doesn't make sense. Really trusting, as Sid points to, that life is abundant. Life, life is life. That love, that essence, that breathing essence is behind you. It's the wind under your wings. Julie wrote in the chat, I hear you are held. I think of intuition, I love to talk about intuition as moments when the spiritual eye flies wide open and we just see with crystal clarity. The minute I laid eyes on Bill Pettit, I knew, I knew that we were going to be connected. I was not sure whether it was gonna be a professional or personal relationship, but I knew we were gonna have a deep connection. The spiritual eyes of love flew wide open. One night my little kitty got lost and she was blind and deaf. This was just a little bit before she died at a ripe old age of 21 years old and Bill and I were frantic trying to find her. We, we had a sense she had gotten out of the house accidentally when I was putting up Christmas lights. And I went and sat down in a chair and I just said, you know, Misty, where are you? Talk to me. The eyes of love flew wide open and I saw exactly where she was. She was two and a half doors down the street in the neighbor's backyard. I walked directly to her. That's, that's not special to me. You know, one of the things Sid said to me was that intuition is not special. Everyone has the capacity to see outside the boundaries of time, space, and matter. Everyone without exception. Everyone has access to whatever answers they need. just takes the eyes of love flying wide open. And yet how many of us, including me, oh, keep those eyes closed, right? I gotta figure this out, 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 I don't know what to do, I don't know, I gotta worry, I gotta worry, I gotta worry, you know, and we just, just do it. It's that, you know, Sid talked about how psychological viruses are as natural as breathing. We shouldn't dump on ourselves for that. There's natural as breathing. If anyone has had to sit here in this moment with me and remind themselves to breathe, please put up your hand. Right, right. You've just all done it, right? We've just all been doing it, right? Zoom user, you've been doing it. Kelly, you've been doing it. Colette's been doing it. And we're all just doing it. And so we're all just having these psychological viruses. It just, it's just part of the way the brain operates. But when we take them really seriously and we get all, you know, make concrete out of them with the gift of consciousness, they can feel like they blind us. But as soon as we drop that, the shutters fly wide open. And sometimes they just fly wide open as a grace when we least expect it. I think that's what happened when I met Bill. It was just a grace. The eyes flew wide open. I knew the night I met my first husband. Curiously, he was a Catholic priest, so not free to marry, and 20 years older than I was. But the first night I met him, 
<sighs> the eyes flew wide open and I wrote in my journal that night, I just met the man I'm gonna marry. Now, how's that one gonna work? <laughs> no. Three years later, we married and had a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful daughter and a beautiful life together before he died. There have been times, I'm sure that if we open the floor, all of you could tell me about times when you stepped off a, a, off a cliff, when you did something, when you took a risk, when you just recreated things, threw things up in the air and took a risk and did something and just did it because you knew it was right. The eyes of love flying wide open. Fly wide, fly with those eyes open. Because as Sid was saying, love has your back. It's abundant. He used that word, abundant. You'll have everything you need. If there was one thing I, I would want to encourage you to do, it's, it's, it's to just hold in your heart as a possibility going forward that you are love in motion. Even when you don't feel like it. I think when you ponder that, Linda, you really get to get a sense of the illusion, don't you? You know, it, it can be quite difficult for to grasp the concept of that when you hold in your heart the realization that you are loving motion. It puts into perspective the fear of life. You know, the, the antithesis of love is fear. One of them is a true reality. And one of them is an illusory reality. You get a sense of the ego. And I think that's it. You know, once you start to get a sense of the ego, you start to see it for what it is. Mm -hmm. The only thing that really ever suffers. I think that's a beautiful thing to ponder. Mm -hmm. You know, you said something, Dave, that has, has struck me through the years that Sid did not talk a lot that I can find or remember about fear there is that quote that's attributed to him about if if um about if the only thing we recognize something was about about fear then that alone would change the world but I've never been able to find the source of that quote in Sid's body of work but interestingly I think he went back one step I think he went back one step behind fear and he talked a lot about love and judgment. And he talked about how we're always going back and forth between love and judgment. And it occurs to me that, 
that the, the, the step back that I see in that is that the way we create fear is by judging something. rather than being in the, op the open, what isness? This is what is. I don't have to put a category on it. I don't have to put a judgment on it. I just move through it and keep creating. And I think the power of the gift of consciousness to me is that what what we notice is what we create. I'm noticing a lot of judgment. I'm gonna be pretty afraid. Like, like for a good example, um, if I'm gonna leave a job and take another job and I have a lot of fear that I'm not, it's not gonna work out because I'm judging myself is not enough or I'm judging the work is too hard or I'm judging, judging anybody or anything related to the decision, I'm gonna experience a lot of fearfulness and that might stop me in my tracks. But the fearfulness is all coming from judgment. If I know who I am, if I know that I am that living, breathing essence, the bigness of that, there's no judgment. I'm just creator. And I'm either creating my fear or my eyes are wide open and I'm creating from love and making the impossible possible. You know, we all, we all have things that happen in life. I, I would say if I were going to identify at this moment the supreme ordeal of my life so far, it was the sudden loss of my first husband in an automobile accident on Christmas Eve uh, in 1999. <clears throat> but the amount of gold that I've mined from that experience I could never call it a tragedy I've seen so many things that are the direct result of moving through that experience I've seen how eternal love is I've seen and felt gratitude for the amount of love I had in that relationship with him. I have a beautiful daughter who's gone forward from that relationship and, and had two children who carry my genetic material and the genetic material of her father. They're like us living into the future. It's really an incredible thing. I've learned so much about my thinking. I've learned so much about my noticing. I've known so much about my power to create from that experience. There's nothing tragic about it. Zip zero nada. Now I'm not saying I walk around, you know, praising the sun, the moon, and the stars that I had that experience. It was a really difficult experience, but it was not a tragedy. It was not a trauma. The intuitive way of love guided me through that and kept showing me, me bigness, greaterness, bigness, more, more incredible things about how life is and how life operates. It led me to Bill, led me to Sydney Banks, it led me beyond that. It just keeps creating, it just keeps evolving if we let it. One of, so I just finished a book that's with an editor. Hopefully we'll get it into print by the end of this year. And it's a, it's a, a spiritual memoir. 
And one of the stories I tell in the book, when I, when I saw it, we just, I just laughed and laughed and laughed. So when I was uh, 21, <clears throat> I was engaged for the first time to a photographer. And he was, he was kind of the quintessential bad boy. And uh, I, I think I had been a very, very good girl. And I found pieces of myself in that relationship that I hadn't even known existed. And uh, so we had just gotten engaged. We had just, he had asked my father if we, he could have my hand in marriage, we were a very traditional family. And we were starting to think about a wedding, hadn't bought a ring yet. And all of a sudden he wasn't calling anymore. He just kind of like dropped out of the face of the earth. And so I drove to where he lived, which was about at that point, two miles, two, two hours north of where I was living, got to his house, and I knocked on his door and I could hear people laughing behind the door. I could hear him and I could hear a woman, but they weren't answering the door. And I figured out, oh my God, he's in there with another woman. And subsequently I found out that he had in fact gotten involved in a relationship with another woman. So I was feeling very betrayed and I actually slipped into a year of very deep depression. Well, if I had, chosen a title for that story in that year, I would have called it, I'll, I'll use a different name, Paul and his betraying junk. Two years later, and I probably would have put a swear word in there just for emphasis. Two years later, three years later, <clears throat> when I had met my future husband, I probably would have called that chapter, Paul, I escaped a bullet named Paul. So five more years later, I probably would have called that chapter, whatever happened to Paul? And now the chapter in the book is called The Bohemian Photographer. And it's all about what I learned from him and from what I learned from that experience. Well, I didn't have to make myself think my way to that place where my heart is filled with love when I think of him and what I think of what I learned from him. It just happened. It was effortless. Consciousness just moved me forward. It evolved me, love evolved me. And yet I know that I had a part in that because I, I know I've worked with a lot of people. I've been working with people for over 40 years individually. I, I know that people can hang on to and refuse to let go of judgmental thoughts. about people and experiences. I'll give myself some credit. I didn't do that. I just let life pull me forward. And on its own, it wasn't time that healed it. It was consciousness that healed it. I started to see things differently. My understanding evolved. The power is in the listener. The power is in the seer. I thought about it differently. I saw it differently and it was different. It was no longer an experience of trauma or betrayal. It was an experience of profound learning and love. We all have that capacity. Life is intuitively moving us forward. And if our spiritual eye is opened wide, we just see it. We just see it. It comes to us in its own time and in its own way and in its own place. And if any of you are out there thinking, oh, I haven't been able to do that. Don't compare yourself to me. Remember, the power is in the listener. And if you can say, wow. 
Maybe there's something for me to see there. How can I see something that's happened to me differently? What intuitive guidance is there behind life that is healing me that maybe I haven't even been aware of that I've been blocking? You'll find your answer. One of the things that I noticed when I really started to study Sid Banks, um, <clears throat> I was for a while I was teaching a course that I called Life is Spiritual Theater. <clears throat> and I really went back because I was taken by that metaphor and I, I wanted to bring forward the pieces in Sid's work that really seemed to connect with it. And, and one of the things I noticed that I hadn't noticed before is that across his entire body of work, his entire legacy that he left behind for those of us who would be touched by his insights was that he had, had a very profound insight that love and forgiveness were absolutely inseparable. He called them two sides of the same coin. And it came to me that we tend to personalize that and think that what, what we have to forgive is people and ourselves, which is part of it, it's a big, big part of it. But I also think we have to forgive life. I often find when I'm sitting with people and listening deeply that what I'm hearing is not so much that they can't forgive a person, they can't forgive that something happened to them in life with a particular person. They can't see that love is creating behind that, using that, moving through that to teach, to, to explore, to move beyond, to deepen the understanding of what is behind life. But as soon as that willingness to forgive life starts to kick into place, then those spiritual eyes fly wide open and something really beautiful and powerful can happen. Love makes the impossible possible. <clears throat> Love is a living, breathing essence that the wise can pluck from the air at will and then like a master artist, mold it into something beautiful, create with it. It's, it's beautiful to me to think that if I look around at my life and I see something that I've created that just is no longer fitting for me or that I want to move beyond or that I want to see differently or want to experience differently, the power is in the artist, the power is in the listener, the power is in me, that all I have to do is just be something differently. And I'll see the change. I hope you have um, touched your magnificence. So I'm going to completely stop there and just listen for any comments or questions and see where that, how that takes us to the end of our time. That was beautiful. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. We've got about five, ten, just over, just under ten minutes left. If anybody's got any. Anything they'd like to say to Linda, any comments or observations or anything like that, please don't be shy. Karina's put a love heart up and Zoe's put a hand up. Zoe. Okay. Hi, Linda. Um, 
I am so moved and inspired that I almost don't have words. Um, touching into the pure essence of my I amness and finding my feet grounded on the pathway that I truly am walking, coming home to myself. I feel like I've sprouted wings and as I go about my life and touch other people's lives, it's helped me personally and in also relating to others. So my heart is very full of gratitude and love for your presence and your sharing generosity. Thank you. Oh, I can see the beautiful light and softness in your face. <laughs> and the tears. <laughs> <laughs> tears are good. I love being moved. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. I think Julie just reiterated that point. Total gratitude. I can really feel that coming from you, Julie, at me. I can just see it in your face. Thank you. Ali. Hello, Linda. Hi. Um, could I just ask you what you meant by forgiving life? It kind of made me feel emotional when I didn't quite understand what you meant. Well. You know, it's like Sid said, and I know all of you have experienced it, that life is a contact sport. We all get bumped around and some of us get bumped around a lot. And I don't know the mystery of that. You know, I, one of the things I hold on to is something that Sid said on one of his videos. When you accept the mystery, you join the mystery. I don't know. I don't know why I've had some of the precise experiences I've had in life or some of the experiences that the people I've worked with in my 40 year career in mental health have just taken me to my knees at times. So, you know, a lot of people, um, the way they express their inability or difficulty to forgive life is that they'll say they're mad at God. How can there be a God who would allow these awful things to happen? Well, that's part of the mystery. But when I moved to that place of seeing, seeing that we're all kind of on a playground, bumping into each other, bumping into what's going on in the natural world, it just helps me to think about, yeah, forgiving that, forgiving that, you know, just accepting the what isness of it and truly trusting. This is the other side of that, that I'm really guided through it. I'm not alone in it. There really is an abundant intelligence behind life that keeps creating with whatever is in front of it.
Yeah, I think the trust thing is mm. I've begun to get glimmers mm. of that. Mm. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think that's one of the most beautiful things that, that people can cultivate is that trust and that faith. And I think it, I think it's as a statement, isn't it? Trust is earned. Mm -hmm. You know, quite often we have to we have to go through hard times to come through it to learn that. And again, not religious, but another beautiful quote of Jesus was, "If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to the mountain, move, and the mountain would move." Wow. Mm. You know, and I've pondered that a few times. That statement. I believe he means that on two levels. I believe he literally means if you have faith, the size of a mustard seed, just a tiniest amount of faith, you have the ability to accomplish amazing things physically in the world. But on the other hand, it's also if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, move and the mountain will move, the mountain being obstacles within our mind. Faith will, faith will neutralize them and will walk through. And we'll see, we'll see it for what it was. No, it's it beautiful. Yeah, and mustard seeds are really tiny, aren't they? Tiny, yeah, <laughs> tiny little things. Tiny little things. It, it's saying it doesn't take much. Just a small shift in consciousness can bring around a catastrophic shift in a positive way for a life. That's such a beautiful notion. Um, I haven't mentioned this to anybody yet, but one of the things, and if you don't wish to be part of this, you are free to leave. No, no, no judgments. But one of the things Jen and I like to do at the end of our community groups is we like to send love out into the world. And we just like to sit quietly for five minutes in the peace that we sit in, because this world isn't sitting in that much peace at this moment, but we are a fortunate few who get to experience this. And we're a resonance. And higher frequency always cancels out lower frequency. It's physics. And I think that this firework show, which Linda, you brought the big bangs love. That was truly stunning. Honestly, loved it. A truly beautiful way to end a beautiful three days. We cannot thank you enough. And your kindness and your generosity and the love you show Jenny and I. Both you and Bill. Awesome, awesome people. <clears throat> Linda, how do people get in touch with you, love? Um. <clears throat> I have a, a website, actually two, www.lindasandalpettit.com. And my, the website I share with Bill, thedoctorspettit.com, T-H-E-D-R-S, pettit.com. My email address is Linda, Linda at, Linda at, T-H-E-D-R-S-P-E-T-T-I-T.com. So feel free to reach out and ask a question or drop an insight or just say hello. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for making this such a beautiful event. I personally have loved, I've loved every minute of it. And to people watching in the future on recordings, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What a wonderful way to end. Okay. Stop the recording. Yeah, we'll stop the recording. Sending out a lot of love to you all. <laughs>